Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Day two of the Women of LD event produced by the training, learning, and development community. Thanks for joining us. Let's check to see, make sure we've got people rolling in. Oh, yes. Here we go. Everyone's coming back in and seeing those text things. Um, welcome back. I am so excited to have our opening keynote for today, Megan Torrance. And Megan has um, presented with the training, learning, and development community in the past a few times. Really just incredible stuff. Jess Jackson, um, last year at the Women of l and event we did. And this year, we have her here um, talking about career wake-up calls you need to hear. And I have kind of um, the standard bio that I'm going to read off for you, Megan. But um, if those of you who don't know Megan, Megan is the CEO and founder of Torrance Learning. Um, she has over 25 years of experience in learning design, deployment, and consulting. Uh, let's see. It was the agile project management thing that I think I started when I first started to hear about, about you, Megan. And then, of course, now your tremendously popular XAPI cohort, which I know Devin Torres is in the cohort. And just most people that I know tend to like at least filter through that XAPI cohort at one point or another. So it, it really is. If you haven't heard about the XAPI cohort, go to Torrance Learning. You can learn more about that. And with that, Megan, thanks again for doing this. I'm going to go ahead and hide myself from the stage and let you take over. Awesome. Awesome. Luis, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for holding this space for us, um, this this powerful uh, community and, and, and this opportunity to really focus in on on what women are doing um, of, of all sorts. So uh, thanks folks for the uh, the shout outs on the cohort. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, a, a little bit of that, that journey that, uh, that Luis mentioned. Um, and, and as we talk about kind of career wake up calls, I'll, I will tell you, this is kind of funny. So um, while I get my screen shared here, uh, Luis, I'll mess, didn't call, nobody calls anybody up. Luis sent me a message and said, hey, we're doing this event. Would you, would you join us for it? I'm like, absolutely, right? Luis is one of those people when he calls, I say, yes. What is it that you need me to do, <laughs> right? So I start with a yes and then, uh, and then the what, what, right? Because uh, Luis is a, a, we'll talk about this. Luis is a powerful connector. This community is a powerful connection point. Um, and, and, and it's something that is, is, is really unique and very special. Um, and I said, great, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about agile project management? Do you want to talk about data for learning? Uh, do you want to talk about, uh, how we in L and D cultivate racial equity in the workplace? He's like, no, I want you to, to be like authentic. Like, Oh, it's like, well, what makes Megan, Megan? I'm like, Oh, those are hard and weird things to talk about. I talk about tactical things, right? I talk about doing things. Um, and that's my, my comfort zone, right? So um, I, if you don't know me um, and, and don't feel like that's like you, you've missed something, right? Um, we've just run in different circles. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder at Torrance Learning and um, we build custom learning experiences, primarily for the corporate market, uh, and some, some pieces around there. We do a lot of association work, some, um, some research, some higher education research work, which is super fun. Uh, LAMA is our, our method for how we do that. So we spend a lot of time talking about agile methods in our work. Uh, we founded the XAPI Learning Cohort uh, as an opportunity to help people learn about data um, in the, the learning space. And um, uh, started doing a lot of work with Jess Jackson a couple years ago on how we can cultivate racial equity in our workplaces. And, uh, and, and that's just been a really fantastic new opportunity for me to learn a lot and share it as we go. I also facilitate courses in executive women's leadership and the psychology of leadership at eCornell, which has been a fantastic learning experience for me. But I was thinking to, to, to you, know, you know, authentic and career path and all this stuff. And I thought, nobody would have planned this. I would not in high school have told you there would ever be a PowerPoint slide. Well, I don't think PowerPoint existed when I was in high school. But, but I would not have ever thought that there would be a presentation in which I would have the ability to 
talk about all these very different things. So I'm going to ask you all, and this is going to be super interactive today. I'm going to ask you, put in the chat, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were much younger? And also, um, give us like when you wanted to be. Like, so when I was in elementary school, I wanted to be a veterinarian. When I went to college, right, I love this, right? When I went to college, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a journalist, a French language trans translator, or a nuclear physicist none of which have much at all to do with instructional design. I wanted to be a Nobel winning author and a university professor, authors, lots of authors and writers. Wow. A phone operator. Love it. A trainer, elementary school, an author, a teacher, a therapist, a dentist, a computer programmer, and third grade. Awesome. A biologist or a zoo teacher, right? I love all this. So <laughs> Joanne, <laughs> note, I have weak ankles. And so Here's the thing, right? we all have these, these wild dreams. Now, I imagine that you all can construct a cohesive story about how you ended up in your role from wherever these wild ideas of your future would be, right? I can construct a very cohesive sounding story now that I know the thread backwards, right? But, Right. But back then I could not have gotten here. Right. It's a, a long and twisted path. And whatever your long and twisted and interesting path may be, there are some things you learn along the way. I want to. I, I, I want to share just before we get started, and a few of you said you wanted to be teachers. Um, this picture I found as I was looking for like inspiration uh, for this session, right? And I found this picture and this is my grandmother and my child. So Doris, my grandmother and M. And these two have it, it, it helped me as I was thinking about this session, really helped me frame this without even knowing it, right? Um, and M is now 20. This is a pretty old picture. My grandmother's passed away. Um, but these two have had such an impact on my life. Uh, my grandmother never learned something that she didn't teach. Seriously, she learned how to ride horses. She taught riding. She learned how to ho hook rugs. She taught rug hooking. She learned all this stuff. She was a den mother. She, she, she was taking classes in her 80s on woodworking, right? all sorts of stuff. right? Um, both of these teachers have been incredibly inspiring. Um, they're not easy teachers, not either of them. They're both smiling here. Um, <laughs> they don't always smile at me. And both of them have made me cry. Right? Um, but they've both been such a very powerful influence on my life. Right. Um, and by the way, those Band-Aids on those needs actually weren't covering anything up. <laughs> um, Take a look here, right? As a girl growing up, right? My family, my community surrounded me with tons of uplifting messages. Go ahead and put in the chat, right? What messages were you influenced by, right? These positive, uplifting, you can do anything. You can do hard things. Annie, yes, right? Totally. She believed she could, so she did. And our mom, right? And take the opportunity. Every morning is a new chance for a great day, right? Really, it was me. Right. So all of these really powerful, uplifting messages. Um, yeah. You know what? A lot of us take a big hit as adolescents. Right. Big hit as adolescents, because that's just a, 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 a gut punch to your psyche and your ego. Right. So you're faking it uh, or you're not. Right. But there's so many. Right. 
messages about you can do anything. And so we launch out into this world like I can do hard things, right? Anything a boy can do, but in high heels, right? And this has been, right, you, you can be an astronaut, right? You can do anything, right? And then, right, the next layer of messaging that comes in on this, right? You should do, like, there is no reason why you shouldn't do all the things. And if you're doing it right, Right. You're do if you're doing all the things, you're doing it right. So what are some of the other messages we get to right? That's kind of like YOLO here, right? What are some of these other messages? Do it now. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Yes. If not now, when? If not you, then who? Yeah. Right? It's only too late if you don't start now. Ooh, good one. Good one. Oh, and you know what? Career changes in these conversations. There's no timeline for awesome. Ha! Today is the day. Seize the day. Um, I just found out also everybody saw Carliner. Uh, one of my uh, fave thinkers in our space just wrote a new book on career anxiety through tough times, um, right? It's very, very timely, um, great for your mentees, great for yourself, great for your college age students and nieces and nephews and children. Great stuff. Today is the day, right? It's a, not a mistake if you learn from it, right? Awesome. Awesome stuff. Basically, life is short do all the things, right? So let's add the next layer in here, right? Hustle. This one in the middle, right? This one in the middle, actually, I made myself into my own personal meme. I printed out a whole bunch of copies of it. I laminated them and I put them everywhere. I had them on my fridge. I had them at the office. I had them in my car. Right? Hustle beats talent when talent doesn't hustle. Okay. So let's take a pause because this is uplifting and inspiring stuff. Right? Yeah. Sometimes this is exhausting. Right? You have, you can do anything. You should do everything. If you aren't succeeding, it's probably because you're not hustling as fast as everybody else. No wonder we're a heap of anxiety and pressure and stress. I've had people tell me they're taking a look at my Outlook calendar. Makes them anxious, right? Toxic positivity, right? You can do all the things. And here's the thing. If you're not wildly successful and rich, it must be your own fault because you can do anything. You should do everything, right? And hustle is how you do it. This is why, right? And, 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 and even, right, so even <coughs> all this stuff ignores systems of oppression, right? And power dynamics and privilege, right? That we all navigate every single one of us, right? Has a huge part to play. You can hustle and hustle and hustle and hustle, right? And still not get ahead. And all the messaging may make you feel like it's your fault. I read a thing the other day that the failure to know, because of the failure to negotiate their salaries on their first job, women can be giving up between half a million and a million dollars in lifetime earnings. The focus of the article was that giving up of the half a million to a million dollars. You know what I honed in on? The failure to negotiate. You know who that sounds like failed? The women who don't negotiate. What about the structures in which we're required to negotiate? What about, right? Everybody says, well, women don't choose to negotiate, right? People of minorities don't choose to negotiate, right? Therefore, maybe they've done something wrong. No, we don't negotiate because we face a penalty for doing so, right? There is influence and, and pressure to not do so. Right? So all of these messages, 
right? All of these messages are really, really hard and can be really, really dark. So if you've had dark moments, if you've had anxiety, if you've had depression, right? No wonder. A few years ago, I landed at an airport. I had no idea where I was or why I was there. Think about it. When you land at an airport, it doesn't say necessarily, they don't all say, welcome to Dallas. It just gives you a gate number. That's all you can see from the outside. And right as you're looking, I had a window seat. I looked at my calendar. I had my phone with me, right? I looked at my calendar on my phone and it said I was going to, I was supposed to be in Dallas and I was meeting with a very high profile client that I'd never met with before. And I didn't believe my own calendar. I had no evidence that told me where I was. I actually texted a friend back home to ask for help because I wasn't sure I could trust my own systems. I was having a temporary amnesic episode because of my stress, because of the push. That is scary stuff. And it didn't last long, but I will tell you, right? I will tell you, it took about two years of traveling after that to not be terrified to go into airports, not sure that when I got off the plane, I would know where I was or why I was there. Right? Fortunately, I haven't had one of those. But if I ever come up to you in an airport and I say, hi, where are we and why? You will know exactly why, right? And I'll tell you, thanks, Luis. I've not told this story professionally ever. So these are big things. So what can we do about this stuff, right? What can we do about this stuff? I had a mentor a few years ago who told me about a fantastic exercise that she and her husband do every year at New Year's. They take a look at where they are in life and they project forward what they've got left and what's ahead and to plan. And this is the feeling, right? That you have time, that you have spaciousness and they don't look back at all of the baggage from the past. That's done. It certainly has influenced you. It's why you are who you are, right? But they don't look past they look forward and it's an opportunity and it's something I actually do myself every year. Uh, and I did it this week for you all. I updated it. And here's what's interesting, right? Right. I am 51, right? And so I have plotted out over decades. What are some of my plans? Where might things be busy? When am I, right? When are my big early uh, or earning spots and my nuts? And, 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 and you know what, Lisa? Yes, this looks, ex this looks like a fishbone. It is not a fishbone. It just happens to be laid out like a fishbone. And that's really good insight because what I've done is I've adopted a layout that looks like it's a causal analysis. But if you look at the details, it's not a, a root cause analysis like a fishbone's going to give me. This is a timeline and just how I've, I've spiked items on it, right? So look what I've got here. Um, if I focus in on some of these earlies, right? So I've, I've, right, I'm digging in deep on Torrance Learning. I also have coming up I'm going to be, I, currently I'm the VP, that's the easy job. In two years, I'm going to be the president of a board that I'm on for two years. At the same time, I'm also teaching for eCornell. And I'm like, I'd love to do that for the next 15 years. And my kid wants to go to school. Hopefully my mom and dad will hold off on that time when they need to have more help. But I am looking at a train wreck if all of those things pile on. So maybe I might take a look at what can I slide forward? Right? What can I slide forward? Right? When should I, right? I may want to take posh, timely vacation, or like, like long time and then fancy vacations. Right? But really, 
that's not my space. I am physically most able to take active vacations now, right? Um, and and posh, more posh vacations once my mortgage is paid off and I have a little bit more time. And then maybe these I can weave in my relaxing vacations when I'm physically perhaps less able to go out and hike 15 miles a day. I can maybe combine that with some of my consulting and the, my teaching. And then my kid will probably retire about the time I'm 80. And what does that look like, right? So there's, there's, you can bring whatever focus makes sense for you into this. But this is something that Kathy had, had shared with me and was such a gift because what this told me was, I don't have to do it all now. This is my anti YOLO. I don't have to do it all now. And it was a really powerful message for me. Now, okay, I know, right? It is not, it is not a straight line. And I will tell you in the same week in which I've been working really hard on this presentation for you and think going really, really deep, I found out that a hockey coach of mine had a spinal cord injury playing hockey the other day. And the best thing they can say about him right now is that he's breathing on his own. I had a good friend who is 50 years old, just diagnosed with AFib, right? I know it's not a straight line and we don't know where it's going, but I also don't have to pressure myself to do all of the things right now. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. Take a screenshot of this. Take a screenshot of this, or you could just scribble it because it's a really fast one, right? And take some time this weekend to start putting things on your timeline, right? To start putting things on your timeline and start thinking about, right, where can you give yourself that space going ahead, right? And, and at, right, so Kristen, absolutely, right? It's not the... It's not the plan. I, I teach project management, right? It's not the plan that's important. It's the planning, right? It's that thinking and, and putting that ahead, right? So think about your timeline. Now, if what we're doing is we're assuming that this is a journey and I don't have to do it all today, right? I'm doing it. I'm actually training for a 22 mile endurance hike. It'll be the wildest, most adventurous thing I can do or that I've ever done. I'm pretty excited about this, right? I have a gigantic backpack. I'm the kind of person every time I have a training hike that results in a, a like I forget something, a misstep or whatever, I put more things in my back. I have a 32 liter backpack that's pretty darn full. I've got an amazing, right? an amazing safety kit. I got extra socks because one day one of us needed extra socks. I've got a space blanket just in case I get lost out in the woods, which I don't because I stay in the trail, right? So I'm putting a lot in my pack. I'd like to share with you a few things that I have in my pack that I'm planning on using for my long journey in my career, wherever that happens to go. Right? So let's talk about your network, your voice, and your reach. I've already given you one tool, the timeline tool. We're all going to then be working. I've got two other tools as we go. So here's something that's important to know. Right? Tool number one, right? Doing your job really, really, really well is not enough. I know you were told that. that. In fact, um, I'll get you an article link here, right? I know you and I, right? Everybody was told, right? Do your job really, really well. What's the thing? If you do your job twice as, twice as well, you'll get half as many opportunities as the next person, right? We've all been told, sit down, be quiet, do your job really, really well, you'll get the, performance, the, pr the promotion. Yes, you absolutely have to do your job really, really well. Okay. But no, it's called the tiara syndrome. Nobody's going to come and put the tiara on your head because they see you doing really well. In fact, the higher up you progress and everybody around you does, the less they see what it is that you are doing. Right? Unless you have a network that knows what you're doing okay? and you can get things done. The natural networks that exist for other people may not exist for you without intentionally doing it. We have to build them. 
Okay? And I am not talking about networking. I hate networking. I mean, I like networking. I like meeting people, but man, I will tell you one of the most terrifying things other than getting off airplanes, right? The one of the most terrifying things you could do is drop me into a cocktail party with hundreds of people there. That's so why if you see me at a conference, I'm, I'm trying to do something for the cocktail party. I would rather serve the drinks than be mingling in a large group of people, right? I don't like networking, but I do like building a strategic network. Right? And if, in my work at eCornell, Professor Deborah Streeter has a map that looks kind of like this. And this is pretty powerful. This is tool number two. Go ahead and take a picture right? or a screenshot of this. This is how you map right, the people in your network. And then you can use this to identify where there might be gaps. They don't have to all be equally filled in. Right? They don't have to all be equally filled in. Right? But this is an important space, right? So here's what I'm going to do, right? So I'm going to fill in just so you can see. Everybody got a screenshot of this already? If not, you can borrow one from one of your new network buddies here in TLDC, right? So as I look at this, right, you know what? We all have one there, right? So Luis is absolutely in my industry outside my organization and a powerful connector right a strategic connector right operational is how do i get my day-to-day -day job done right so for example i may have very well placed people in my network but they help me get my day-to-day -day job right so i i was once able to call up the ceo of one of the um, e-learning authoring tools right because the whoops wrong button uh, because um, it, it wasn't hit, that product wasn't communicating XAPI correctly for a network connections LMS, right? And so I was able to get that job done super fast. That's my operational network, right? I just met Amanda while networking before this session, and Amanda is now part of my operational network. If I have a project in which I have a um, uh, a, a need to have a deeper understanding of how rural America works and learns, I know I can reach out to Amanda because I've made that connection here. I, I have all sorts of connections. I know my town's library, the leader of the, the director of my library. Um, I know a physician who went to the Olympics as a teen doctor. Um, I know news reporters, right? Put in people here. I know designers and actors, right? Um, my hiking buddy is a professional photographer, right? That's a personal outside of my space, right? And so there's all sorts of right, people that you can map okay, in your network and then, right, then what you need to do is make sure that you identify right, who are who are the sponsors, who are your connectors, how can you help them and be a resource for them, right? And, and don't neglect this personal space, especially this one, right? So this is a shout out to my best friend, Michelle. Right? Michelle is a professional uh, photographer. I almost said firefighter. That would be cool, too. She's not, uh, right? Um, and so, yes, in my professional life, it's super awesome to be able to say, hey, do you have an image that whatever, right? Um, but she and I also a number of years ago were looking at like, we really wanted a leadership development program for women and we couldn't find exactly what we wanted in our community. So you know what we did? We made it. We created a leadership program. Right? We invited a bunch of people to it. We had four fantastic sessions and the network we built in that space still serves us today. So you can even build the network that you need to get things done. It's pretty powerful. So speaking of network and sponsors, okay, I'm going to show you a picture that is actually very different, right? So your, your network is one of your tools in your backpack. Your voice is another tool in the backpack. Okay. I'm going to show you a picture that makes me somewhat uncomfortable to do this. It's one of the best photographs that's ever been taken of me. 
I'm using my voice. That's one of my sponsors. That guy behind me clapping, that was my banker. And he was the one who got me to come to that event, eventually be the chair of the event, and then lead the event and be the, the MC as well, right? And here's the thing, we have a voice. We have that, it's hard for us to talk about ourselves. For some of us, it is very hard. It's easier to talk about the tactical things or our teams or what other people are doing. And it is a good thing to do that. It helps to soften the message, but we often don't use our, 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 our outside voice, our voice that's proud about what it is that we're doing. And whenever you are talking about how fabulous your team is and what your company is doing and what other people are doing, don't forget to talk about what you're doing to support them because you are an important part of that message. Whether it's a job interview, you're talking with a, a prospective sponsor, you're dissecting your work and how you do that with your mentor, mentor that's really important. And it's not to say right, that you right, talk all the time. It's also really important to be quiet and to be still and to listen and to learn. Right? And learning those two things is part of what we do as we age. Right? And we get experience under our belt. Now, we've talked about using your network and using your voice. Let's talk about using your reach. So just in chat real quick, um, have you ever been the token woman, the token training person, the token something, right? The token person of color, the token, yeah, right? Okay. This is a common experience. Okay. And how does it feel to be the token? Okay, I just want you to see, I just want you to see all of the other people in this space, because sometimes when we're the token, we feel like we might be, um, uh, we might be alone, right? In, in, in that situation we are, but we're not, right? So, um, right, it's intimidating, it's discouraging, it's frustrating, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure, right? And so, yeah, okay, so this is some fantastic stuff. Here's the thing, right? Um, when you are the token, right, it's an opportunity. You can either say no, no, I am not going to be your token woman for whatever. Okay. Um, that has traditionally not been my approach because what I'm getting when I have that is I actually get a seat. I may not like how I got the seat, but I am actually getting a seat and I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to own it. It is a lot of pressure. Absolutely. It is a lot of pressure, but when you get it, you can use it. And I'll tell you another story, right? And I'm so glad Luis kind of hinted at this when we started. Starting in 2011, 2012, I started writing articles, doing conference presentations, offering workshops, right? Making my name, my thing was agile project management for instructional design projects. And it still is, right? It still is. That was my thing. That's where I was focused on it, laser focused on building that thought leadership and building that brand. Okay. Along comes XAPI. I'm like, whoa, shiny. This is super awesome. This is going to change our industry. This is really fun. And I start using it. I start getting really smart about it. Right? I start using, I'm doing stuff. I'm doing real work in this space. I am not an expert in this space. This was before we'd even started the cohort. Right? I was just doing my thing. There was another woman named Megan, Megan Bow, who was doing, she was a leader in the space of XAPI. And at a conference, the conference was pulling together a panel. And the conference drew on, and on XAPI and on this emerging stuff. And they mixed Megan's. And I got invited to be on that panel. Now, you know why Megan was being invited? 
Megan was being invited because they needed a woman on the panel. She was very, very smart. Absolutely. Right. But she's also right. They needed a woman on the panel. I see the email and I say, I'm I'm flattered. Thank you very much. But I think you have the wrong Megan. Megan Bo ought to be here. And fortunately, the person who sent that email, right, who's a, a sponsor and a good friend of mine today, said, no, actually, why don't you be on that panel and we'll get Megan Bo? That, that was my first, uh, Christine, it was not on, not on purpose. That, because he didn't know I was what I was doing, right? That was my first opportunity to be on a stage talking about XAPI. Was I terrified? You better believe it. There were some serious luminaries on that stage with me, right? So I was, I, I, I was a token, I was an accident and I made it work, right? Then, right, once you've got that seat, remember when we said, right, what does it feel like to be the token? Lonely, a lot of pressure, right? Lonely, a lot of pressure. So when you've got that seat, that's when you use your power to invite others. When we started the XAPI learning cohort, it was with intention that I asked one of the women on our team to be the first host. Okay? When we needed a third host, I with intention asked a woman of color to be the host. I make a space that is as inclusive and variety, you know, a lot of diversity, right? In our speaker panel, when I have the opportunity to create a, 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 a program with intention for that, right? Because I have that seat, I then have a responsibility to invite others. So go ahead, take a screenshot of this one so that you remember what I want you to think about is where do you already have a seat? However it is you got it. Where do you have a seat? Where are you close to getting a seat? Where do you want to have a seat? And then who can you make room for? Because you can make room at a table once you are at the table. Okay. And then that takes some of the pressure off you to be the model minority, to be the model or the voice for all of that. Right? Suddenly you don't have to be the one okay, who is um you know the speaking for all of womanhood or all of a particular racial group or all of the people who have a particular uh, neurodiversity right you're making that space and you're more powerful together by the way i want to point out i went out of my way to make sure that every image today that you've seen uh, was taken by a woman um, they're all available on Unsplash and I have cited them as I go. This particular image was taken by a Ukrainian woman. Um, her Unsplash uh, uh, profile says that she is available for hire. I'm not sure if that's currently available for hire, but if you are looking out to um, uh, to source imagery, you, I recommend that you go ahead and, and do that. So today, three tools. Um, three opportunities for you to think and to, to, to process in your own life. How can you use your, right, as you go along your path, how can you use your network and your voice and your reach, your seat, your place to be able to make space for, for others? So let's open it up for, for Q&A or conversation or anything. Um, and uh, I... Um, I, I, in fact, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to, while we're doing that, as, as questions may come in, um, and I don't want to, last time, last time Luis invited me to one of these, I ran over. And so I'm really like very self-conscious about the fact that uh, I don't want to mess up his, uh, his schedule for the day. Um, but I will also see if I can get this, those links live. No, those links are not live. Let me get the link to her site and send that to you. In the meantime, what questions do we have or thoughts or things you want to share? There you go. All right, Q&A. 
Uh, Rabina asks, will I be available in the lounge? Yes, I will be in the lounge for a little bit. Um, and uh, I've got a meeting and then I'm going to come back. But yes, I will. I will be in the lounge. What's the best way to find mentorship with other women in the in industry? So, Dawn, that's a really great question. Um, one is by asking. Right. So it's hard to ask. Um, and it is uh, be, uh, hard to ask. It's not hard to ask. You send a, a, an email or a LinkedIn message. That part's easy, right? It's making the ask, um, and um, and 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 to have a, a, a focus for what it is you're trying to learn. Um, also, know that as much as um, as much as people, the people you want to be your mentors right? Are the people who want to mentor. There are people who do not care to mentor, right? And that's their choice. Um, and it's perhaps better for everyone if that's not a forced thing. Not everybody you ask to mentor them will have time. Um, and so that's a, there's, there's a balance there too, but, um, it is, it, it is Kristen, right? It's, it's, it's emotionally hard. There's also a fair amount of peer, peer mentoring that is also very, very valuable. Right. Um, and um, in the course that I work with at Equinel, they, they make a really interesting distinction between mentors and sponsors. So mentors provide advice. They often do it out of um, a, an interest in you or young people or people growing in their careers or um, just giving back to their industry kind of thing. Um, and you could take their advice or, or not, right? Um, and, and, and they get something out of it. I get a ton out of the mentoring work that I do because it helps me process through things um, much better. Um, the Gwen, I love it. Yes. Okay, Gwen, you are building the network you need right now. You also, by doing that, become the focal point of that network. And you know what? People then say, you know what? Gwen knows somebody who does this. Even with though all Gwen has done is perhaps hosted a, a, a group, right? And made a space. It's so, so powerful, right? So a sponsor then is someone who um, puts their neck out for you and expects something in return. Right. Um, and and it is it is a bit more transactional than a mentor. And for me, it was really helpful to be able to pull those two things apart. Um, a sponsor needs me to show up and do a particular thing and to do it right and to not make them look bad. Right. Whether it's a stretch project, whether it's a, a an actual job, whether it's an introduction to somebody else. My job is to be as responsible about that as as possible. So um, that's that's why, right? I have certain sponsors in in my life, similar to to Luis, right? Um, they they make an ask and I say yes, and I work really really hard to make that work for them. So um, it's just got a little queasy when two women just coincidentally ended up the same event due to mix ups. Yes. Oh, you know what? So here's the thing. Um, yes. So sometimes women. Um, and, and I get it, right? I see, I see women, sometimes perhaps um, women who are a generation older than me, uh, but not, not exclusively. Um, and it's not just women, right? But it's, it's, it's people who come from historically marginalized populations. Um, when they get that seat, when they get that spot in power, okay, it can be very, it can feel very risky for them to let anybody else. If there's only one seat for a woman at the, at the table, I'm not gonna let, I, and I've got it, right? The mentality that they might have is to not let anybody else have that seat, right? Any other women then jeopardize that role as that token, right? So I get it a little bit, right? And there's kind of like the fraternity hazing kind of thing too, right? I live through hell to get, right? In that prior generation, I lived through, sorry, I just were in a session, right? Um, I lived through um, really tough times to get to where I am now, right? Um, and and anybody else who's got it easier, I may have a chip on my shoulder. Um, it disappoints me. I can, I, I can understand the perspective and I can absolutely not be that person, right? So yes, right. So paid my dues. 
Right? And, and, and believe me, doing hard work and paying your dues is important. It's not that it's not important. Right? Um, it, there's a lot of experience that get, gets built with that. Right? Um, but uh, there, there can also be some resentment. Right? Some resentment. This has been a fantastic conversation, everybody. This has been really, really fantastic. Luis, thank you once again. Right? Um, and what a fantastic experience you've, you've created here. So thank I, you. I, you and the, your committee, because I know you have a very powerful committee and like brilliant people who are, you know, you, you sent me some of their committee comments that really, I tried really hard to, to bring those in to, to this. So this has been really, really awesome. I'm speechless, Megan. I can't thank you enough for this. It was, um, I mean, it, I just am floored by your presentation. I, I'm, I want to go like, take a long walk after this one. I just so appreciate it, Megan. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. And I'm so glad that you're willing to share with this community. And, um, and it was just really, really powerful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Cause now I've built a network of people who can be waiting for me at airports all around the, all around the world. <laughs> I'm following you around. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and close this one out. Um, Megan, thanks again. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, Vanessa Alzadi is going to be in the next one. She's talking about um, throw on your sequin jacket and get on that stage. So um, we'll see you in about 13 minutes or so. Thanks again, Megan. Thank you. Enjoy, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.